Hello and welcome to the Lux Debugger programming stream. Uh, we do the stream every Tuesday. What am I doing here? We're building a debugger, a native debugger for C and C++. It is a revolutionary new debugger. It is the next evolution in debuggers. And I need your help to build it. You can go to luxdebugger.com and join the alpha. Download it right now and um, give feedback for its development. Talk directly with the developers. I'm one of the developers. Um, have an influence on, on the development. Try it out for yourself. So go to luxdebugger.com for that. And um, today in this stream, we're going to be, well, first I'm gonna wrap up some things we did in the previous stream. And then we're gonna be looking at the memory cache, which is none of these files. The memory cache, the debugger has to keep a cache of the memory of the program it's debugging. And um, that turns out to be a non-trivial thing. You're like, well, it's memory and it's keeping memory in its memory. Shouldn't that be easy? It's just like memory of memory. Turns out it's, it's uh, a little bit more tricky and we'll take a look at why. I'll explain how the whole thing work, works. Um, I love answering questions about anything. So if you have any questions, you can ask me here live in chat. We can post them in the video, um, and I am happy to explain anything. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at where we left last time. We were we were building native visualizers for a map. And we got distracted because we realized that we need. Um, to know information about parent classes of the underlying types of the stud map. Stud map uh, is actually a parent class of a, of a, of a tree. And um, we needed to be able to learn about that relationship in order to represent the stud map in a native visualizer. So we kind of got distracted with that. I think we had just finished it and we're just getting back to um, <clears throat> implementing the stud, the stud map visualizer when uh, when it got to be really late and I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and I ended the stream. So I did eventually get it to work. Here it is. You see it adds um, uh, it adds a, a entries right here and then we'll also erase entries. And I'm just now noticing that it blinks in and out like that. I'm gonna have to fix that. It wasn't doing that before. Um, but you see it in this line, it's going to map into int.erase find number four, and so number four, which maps to nine, should be erased, and now it's gone. So we did get it working. It actually didn't really take that much more effort. Maybe, it was definitely more than I could have done on stream. It was like an hour of work or so. Uh, but I did, did wanna show one particular line of code, which was so obvious what it should have been, uh, and uh, I debugged it by just by just um, really like staring at it and, and printing out some logs until I realized what it was. This line right here wasn't getting, uh, was re this was expression was returning null. I was, I was getting a null record. And it was trying to get the type of the sub expression that we're casting from. Here we have to cast, uh, we were doing a cast from a sub expression um, and so we have to get the, the like if we're casting A to B, then we have to get A and then we have to get B. And in this case, we're getting A. And what I didn't realize is that it was a pointer to an A because it was like a this pointer instead of, um, instead of just the object A. And so where I was expecting to get A, I was actually getting pointer to A. And as it turns out, uh, Clang, which we're using, has a really convenient method right here, get point T CXX record declaration. So instead of just, I think I was using get CXS, I think I was using something that looked like this before. Um, and a, the, a pointer to the, the type doesn't have a record declaration. Um, so instead I use this convenient get point T CXX record declaration. I, I actually believe 
It could be that I realized that I had this mistake by just staring at the documentation, which is not not great, but it's pretty good. Um, so anyway, then we got something here, and just to, just to close out what this expression ended up looking like, we have to cast to the base class so that we can, um, so that we could, this, this, is the, this is the base class that we detected that the stud map has. We cast to the base class. If there's, uh, we loop through all the base class specifiers. If there's more than one kind of, sorry, if it's a multi-level base class, then um, then we print out an error. We, we stop with an error. Um, this is something I really should support if I want to be complete about it. Um, but just to save myself time, I, I didn't. So I only handle one, one level of inheritance. Um, and then we get the expression type. In other words, the type that we're casting to. And if the, if the base type of this class is equal to the type that we're trying to cast to, then we do all the casting stuff. And the casting stuff itself is really, it's really easy. It's just um, the base class has an offset. We get this base class data. We get the offset out of that. We increase the pointer by that offset. And that's really all the cast is underneath. We can do this because um, we the the application is going to tell us the memory layout of the object. You have uh, you have a struct A, and uh, and the base class is part of that data, and it may be at a certain offset. Um, if you have multiple base classes, then one of them may may be at an offset. If you only have one, this is almost always just going to be zero. Um, if you only have one base class, because it just puts the base class as the first chunk of data inside the class. It could put it anywhere, but it just puts it at the beginning. And so to do this cast, you really just add the offset, which most of the time is going to be zero. You return that pointer, and uh, Bob's your uncle. So casts are, are pretty cheap. We do that, and then we return the results. Um, and that was the real meat of of the, the problem that we were working on. It ended up being pretty straightforward. Uh, after that, it was just a bunch of really straightforward. Um, so you have these, these tree items that you have to evaluate in a map. And then we have to walk the tree. And uh, each time you hit uh, a node in the tree, you have to evaluate the node and then return that node. Let's see return that node in uh, in a big old list of, of values. Here it is. Um, so we build the list of values for the map, and then we send that on back to be rendered. Uh, very similar to how we did it in the array in the first video. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close all that stuff down now because we are going to, we are going to change gears here and look at the memory cache. We're just gonna close all of this. So that so why are we working on this memory cache? I guess a good question to ask is why is it not um like what what is the state that this memory that this uh, memory cache is in in the first place? Basically, I built enough of the memory cache. So I already have a bunch of code built out for it. I built enough of the memory cache to get my debugger basically working, but my goal now is to have a debugger that, like a complete debugger that works enough that I can debug itself. Okay, I'm trying to get rid of Visual Studio. I'm still using Visual Studio for um, to, to debug itself, and I'm trying to get enough functionality into the debugger that I can just get rid of Visual Studio. And I built this memory cache opportunistically, meaning I, um, I, I only built out the parts of the memory cache that were necessary for whatever I was trying to do. So whatever memory patterns um, my debugged program would, would come across, I would build out the debugger memory cache to support that specific memory pattern. So I built a complete enough solution to do what I needed to do. But 
I didn't build, I didn't build the entire solution. And I, every once in a while would hit errors where the memory cache would run into parts of the code that are unimplemented. I didn't put the effort in to build them because um, I was just trying to, um, I, I was just only implementing exactly what I need, but every once in a while I would hit those. So now it has come time to implement all of these, uh, all of these remaining code paths. Like you can see how, you can see how I actually managed to get a lot of mileage out of something that's really like mostly incomplete here. Turns out only a few of these code paths were actually in use. Most of the memory accesses followed a certain pattern. And so I didn't have to write like everything. Um, and that's risky because every time you hit one of these asserts, uh, it brings down the whole process. If, if, uh, if ever there's a assert false in Lux, it just kills the whole thing. Um, it doesn't bother going anymore. It's a bug that I have to fix. And so I kind of have a fail fast um, philosophy here. So this is kind of a risk that uh, the customer is going to run into these. So it's getting time. I'm not going to be able to use this debugger until all of these reasonably until all of these are fixed and we don't have any lingering. Um, this is essentially like crashes, which are bugs. Uh, debugger is not usable as long as these things persist. So it's time to go in there, clean it all up, make it, uh, Im which will greatly improve the stability of the debugger. Um, of course, at the expense of a bunch of work which we're gonna do now. And while we do that, we're going to learn how this memory cache works, which is, it's honestly like, this is maybe the second or third iteration of how this memory cache works. And it's kind of interesting. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to explain it now. Um, let's see here, this is actually what I want down here. So here's a memory cache, memory cache object. And, oh, it's been a while since I've seen these tests. I'm only now remembering what they do. Interesting. So there, so there are actually two concepts here. One is a memory cache, one is a memory range. Uh, I guess three, one is a memory contents. Okay. Uh, Let's look at memory range first, because it's the simplest one. Memory range is just an address and a number of bytes. It doesn't have the actual memory, it's just an address. It's just like, hey, it's a descriptor for the a range of, of memory. It has the starting point and how many bytes are in the range. Memory contents is a memory range plus a buffer of bytes, these are all one byte, that represents that range. And you, if you are astute, you'll notice here that um, a buffer has a size, a number of bytes in the buffer, and the range has a size, number of bytes in the range. And that's redundant, there's redundant information there. But it's actually still, it's, it's not redundant because I use, uh, if the buffer is empty, and the and therefore not the same size as the range, then um, then I use that to signify invalid memory. So, um, and then finally, we have the memory cache, and a memory cache is a memory map, which is just a, a vector of memory contents. So this is going to be a vector of ranges with buffers. And what happens is that every time you call set memory. Um, it either creates a new uh, part of the memory map and um, and fills in that contents so that when you call get memory um, oh there's get memory right there it just looks into this it just looks in this memory map uh, finds the memory it needs returns it Okay, so pretty simple. A memory map, the, the memory cache is just a um, is just an array of arrays, essentially. And the other key thing to know about this memory cache 
is that uh, I, I'm doing everything on page boundaries, okay? My first iteration of this memory cache was kind of, in retrospect, insane. I thought to myself, well, self, which is how I think to myself, uh, I can have arbitrary memory accesses to my debugged program. So I need to be able to think about arbitrary, like if the if this is memory, okay, this is like zero, one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 16, something like that, okay? I probably got the spacing wrong, but you get the idea. And, um, and the user requests, these bytes right here, okay? And then further, later al along the line, request these bytes right here. Then I need to be able to handle this weird overlap. So that was the first pass at this memory cache. Um, I got a bunch of the way through that, and then I realized that that is hugely wasteful. Uh, because if the user requests one byte and then one byte and then one byte and then one byte, then that's going to be four round trips to the debugged process. Uh, we can definitely do better than that. So uh, take two of this thing was to say, okay, the only accesses to this to the debugged program memory are going to be along page lines, memory page lines, memory page. Um, is a, just an arbitrary unit of hardware, uh, usually 4,096 bytes, so 4K bytes, where the it's like a it's like a block of memory uh, for just for hardware reasons, right? The memory is split up into these 4K page blocks, and they're always on 4K boundaries. Okay, like the 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 pages always begin and end. Uh, at the, at you know where where the remainder is zero at 4K. So um, so the the addresses for you know 4K memory addresses you know let's sprinkle some okay some this is a memory address you're always going to see three zeros at the end because 4K is um, there I just increment I just decremented by 4K I just incremented by 4K right. I think I did the math on that right. Um, so a page boundary will always have three zeros at the end of the address. And that means that we're not gonna run into this weird situation where we have overlapping uh, access. Because in this case, the memory cache is just gonna pull the whole page. It's just gonna pull the whole page. It's actually, I, I think it's probably, it's not the same cost. It's gonna be more expensive to pull the whole page than if you request just run one byte because you have to copy for 4K of memory. But there's an overhead of copying memory from one process to another and accessing the memory in that process. And applications often do this thing where they request memory, request memory. So like if I'm showing locals, if I'm showing the locals um, in a, um, in the in the processes panel, there are a hundred local variables. Let's say, then um, it's gonna it's gonna ask for the address of the first one, and the address of the second one, and the address of the third one. Right, like probably all one hundred of those variables will fit in four K of memory, and so if I just every time I get an access, I just I'm just gonna pull the whole page because very likely that similar memory nearby is about to be accessed. Um, and someone is type is messaging me, but I can't figure out who it is. So sorry, person, you're not getting a response. Okay, so um, so I broke up all of the accesses along page boundaries, and that made it a lot simpler to implement this because I can assume that uh, accesses will never straddle page boundaries. I can break those into page boundary. Like this is part of why the hardware is set up with pages in the first place. 
uh, because it's a lot easier to implement if you don't have to handle arbitrary, if you can look at things in terms of the entire page. Okay, so if you say get memory, it will happily return you a memory access result that is only a few bytes, but secretly underneath, um, it, it relies on, it knows the entire page of memory. So let's see whether I enforce that here. I think I actually don't. Interesting. So I don't actually enforce anywhere in here that all of these accesses are set up on page boundaries. And uh, maybe that's our first step. I'll have to update the tests if I want to do that. Yeah, because the tests don't work on page boundaries. Oh no. Okay, I don't actually want to update all the tests on stream. Um, people are definitely gonna log off if I do that. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put in that check right now, but later I will go in and put a check that looks like this. Assert, set memory, assert memory contents uh, dot m range dot uh, m bytes um, modulus 4096 is zero, right? Um, I need to put in a certain here that looks like this. And do I have a, do I have like a page size? Oh, wow, I don't? Okay. I don't actually have a page size. Well, in any case, this needs to be, um, this needs to happen but uh, I'm gonna comment it out for now. But let's just keep writing it, right, just in case. Um, set, set memory only allowed on page boundaries. Okay. So the number of bytes should be a multiple of 4096 and the address should also be a multiple of 4096. Uh, let's see, M range address. I probably need to do some cast here. Something like that. Okay, I'll get all that. If I compile that right now, then um, I will get a bunch of compile errors. So I'm not gonna do that, but uh, so I have a bunch of tests for the memory cache. Ooh, I'm very thorough. Look at all these tests. I love it. Many tests for the memory cache. Um, and it's tricky because there are actually three types of memory. So we'll come back here, okay? I will represent them as... Uh, dash means I don't have this memory. So this means not present, okay? We're gonna say X means um, contains data. It's valid memory. And then the third memory type is I'm gonna represent with um, an octothorpe or a hashtag. And this is invalid memory, okay? Some memory is actually gonna be invalid. For example, on most computers that most of us will ever work with, if you try to access the page at address zero in virtual memory, that is marked by the operating system as invalid memory. You cannot read or write to that memory or else your program throws, uh, um, raises an interrupt, uh, otherwise known in C as raising an exception and crashing with a null pointer error. Um, that's why null pointers that's why no pointers crash in C++. It's because they point to the address zero and that page of memory has been protected by the operating system. If you try to read it, your program dies. And so um, I, as the debugger, can try and read it. And instead of, my pro instead of the debugger dying, uh, I will get the result, hey, that is invalid memory. And so I can store that. And actually, I think I'm gonna change these. I'm gonna say, I think this is like backwards. Okay, so these now represent 
this is going to be this in this notation in this little diagram this is the first page of memory at zero and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth okay and the sixth seven eighth nine tenth so what my um what my cache does is store these pages and i need to handle um a lot of different cases this dash means that the page is not present in the memory so if i let's see i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna do something weird and say that time is the y-axis and the x-axis is a address okay this is like address and this is time <laughs> perfect okay address time okay so right here we said this is the initial state of the memory initial state of the memory and then what happens is at in page eight we set memory set memory page eight okay now page eight has some data has some data whatever the memory is that we set here and then we set memory page nine Okay, and then we set memory page 11. Okay, so these are three completely different cases of what has to be done. Uh, in the debugger and these com three completely different cases have completely different paths through this code um, the first one the memory map is empty and so it's the trivial case it's probably this case right here yeah memory memory map is empty insert point is uh, uh, the it just gives um, tilde zero means like the first thing in the list and so it says, well, there's nothing in the list, so just push those. That's the first case. The second case is when it identifies that there is something in the list and it's touching a previous thing in the list. And so what it has to do is, uh, rather than adding something to this vector, it must expand the existing thing that it's touching. Okay, so we'll, we'll actually append it so there's still only going to be one thing in this vector because you have one contiguous area. And then when you set page 11, it rec has to recognize that it does not have a contiguous area. And so it will make a new contiguous area. This vector is actually a vector of contiguous areas. I'm just going to write that here. This is a vector of contiguous areas. I'm actually going to... Whoops, I don't know if the hockey's right. This cache enforces, this is like really, actually really useful to have this comment here. I should have written this comment before, uh, that every element of M contents is a contiguous area and no two elements, and no two distinct elements form a contiguous area. So if you add something to memory contents, to M contents, it must be non-contiguous. This is also always sorted. Okay, so it must put, put this one first and this one second. Okay, and then I have to handle a case like set invalid memory page 10. And I guess I have to update this comment because I have to say is a, the exception to this is invalid memory, which is allowed to be separate elements, but still contiguous with the rest with 
other elements. Okay. So if I put an invalid page here, then I'm going to have three separate contiguous sections. But then if I say a valid, valid page 10, whereas these three were valid, I overwrite the invalid with a valid, then it must at that point find these three um, pages and make them contiguous. Okay. If I maintain this invariant, that um, this contiguousness invariant, then it makes my algorithm way simpler, right? Um, if I have to look up data, um, it keeps the data from being fragmented. Wait, is this true? Is that true? Is that true? I'm doubting myself. What if it's easier just to allow it to be non-contiguous? What if that's easier? Oh my God. Oh, I remember. This entire, this depends entirely on, yeah. Um, well, that's still okay. So my logic here, let me, let me, uh, let me walk you through my logic here get memory has to return a buffer it's going to copy data into this buffer if i guarantee contiguousness then i can guarantee that this buffer can always be copied from one place if it can be copied it can be copied from one right like if the buffer is here these these two these if if the area if the memory requested is these two pages Then, um, then I can guarantee that I can copy into that buffer just w with one. Um, and so it makes my get memory a lot simpler. I don't have to do any loops here. I don't have to like walk the memory map. I can just find the range that I'm looking for, make sure that it's valid and present, and then buffer.assign cop copy all that memory over. Um, if I don't guarantee contiguousness, then I have to do a loop, which honestly doesn't sound so bad. Doing a loop really doesn't sound so bad. Hmm. And, and here's the concern. Let's say Let's say I'm going to copy this to a new, okay. Let's say I have this memory access pattern. Oops. I'm just going to delete all this so that it doesn't, like that. Um, let's say I have this memory access pattern right here. And I have all of these valid memory regions and then some gaps and then another big valid memory region. Okay. And right here, I did a bunch of setting memory here. And then right here, I decide I want to fill in this gap. That now has to take all of this memory and copy it into a contiguous region into one contiguous region. And like, if I manage to dig myself into that hole, like I, um, I could potentially be copying a lot of memory around there. The alternative is that the vector that contains this map can grow, this M contents can grow like uh, without bound, really. I mean, how big is the memory space in a 32-bit application? Um, that is, I'm sorry, in a 64-bit application, that is 2 to the 64. I'm going to do some math right here. 2 to 64. But then divided by 4,096, because that's how many bytes 
are in a page and we only care about pages, that is still a um, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 digit number, okay? Like you could get a pretty big vector. Um, the vector will never actually get that big. It will never get any larger than the than the than the the memory size of the application. But I basically have to make this decision now if I'm going to complete the algorithm. Hmm. So let's let's see an example of what I'm doing here. If insert point. So insert point equals tilde zero means that um, I need to insert, like the range that I'm trying to insert is at the beginning of the memory map. Uh, it is the next memory area in the map with an end address larger than that of the range or tilde zero if the range starts after everything in the map. Oh, I see. So it, it means I have to insert it at the end or tilde zero is also what you get if if there's nothing currently in it. Okay, so I have to insert it af after everything else currently in the map. Is that what it says? If the range starts after everything in the map. Okay, tilde zero means I have to insert it at the end of the memory map. Uh, but it's not currently empty and it touches the last item in the range. So we're looking at this case right here right now. It touches the last item in the range. Um, and the thing that's currently in there has valid memory. Oh, the, no, the thing being inserted has valid memory. Um, I guess I also have to check whether... Yeah, I have to check whether I'm inserting, like, there, there are four... This is going to be a lot of complicated code here. There are four cases. There's also this case. There's also this, this case. And there's also this case. Okay. These two are invalid. Uh, this is invalid. This is invalid. Okay. So there are four cases that I have to account for here. And actually I've, I'm, this code as, as is, I am noticing is actually incorrect because I check whether the memory that is being inserted is uh, valid. So I am either here or here, get rid of these. I'm either here or here, but I don't check whether the memory currently present is valid. So if it's not, then I could have an error where I append valid memory to invalid memory uh, and that would be a bug um, and I'm realizing that now that this code is way simpler is actually way simpler if I just have a new item in the array for every yeah, I, I think I actually want to refactor all this code. Damn. Damn. I'm super, sometimes you just need to like, I'm currently, you may have heard the expression rubber ducking, where you explain something out loud to a rubber duck in order to make it make more sense to you. Congratulations to your audience. You are my rubber duck. So um, let's see another point, another case here. If it's not touching the current range, then I have a case like this. Could be one of these cases uh, where there's a gap here, okay? And uh, this is gonna be, we're setting page 10. Okay, so insert point is at the end, um, but we've learned that, or sorry, no, insert point is not at the end. 
Oh no, okay, so we're saying insert points is at the end, but it does not touch the back thing. And so it could be one of these four. And it doesn't really matter which one because we, you know, it doesn't, we just take the current memory contents, push them back. This code handles all four of those cases right there. So this is the easy case because we just push it back. This right here really is the hard case. And this right here is also the hard case. So I think I actually have kit code for this already. Um, if the insert point already contains the memory range, then we just have to copy it in. So that's if I'm updating an, an existing one. If we have to insert at the beginning and it overlaps with the current element, Then we have to combine it. Yeah. Yeah, so these are a bunch of cases. Uh, like this overlaps. This is, you know, this is all just a lot easier. I'm realizing if I actually require the opposite of this. If I require that no two, um, that each memory contents is exactly one page. If I require that, and I feel like this code gets a ton easier to write because I can just break up the set memory into different pages and do a loop and write each, you know what? I think I can do that tonight, to be honest with you. I think now that I'm thinking about it, there's like a challenge to myself. I'm kind of excited. Can I, um, can I write that code tonight? And, and if, and if I, if I guarantee that every element in this uh, vector is exactly 4096 and even continue contiguous pieces of memory are broken up, then this becomes a really simple for loop. Uh, maybe not a really simple for loop, but yeah, kind of a simple for loop, it does. I think I could write the whole thing tonight. So here's what we're going to do actually have a lot of test cases um, of memory access. I will write, I will write these test cases later. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do something crazy. <whistles> folks, folks, I'm throwing it out. Okay, my, my first, I think this is version three of this memory cache. And it's going to be the best version yet. I'm throwing out the whole thing. I'm starting from scratch. We're going to keep the asserts. And we're actually going to add these asserts. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and add them in. Because, um... Let's see here. Const size t. Page size equals 4096. We're just gonna go ahead and add this stuff in here because by the time I'm done working tonight, I will go and update all the tests. I need to test literally each and every one of these cases to make sure that my customer, the person using the debugger, never runs into any of the cases. Okay, so um, here's what's going on. We need to we need to make sure that the address lands on a page size and the size lands on a page size. Okay. Now we are going to loop page equals memory contents and range that I'm address. Let's convert that to a size size T. Yes, it's true that I um, that I can only support that I cannot support 120 128 bit uh, target processes with this scheme, and I'm fine with that. Um, actually, we're going to do it this way: page equals zero. 
page is less than memory contents dot m range dot m bytes divided by page size. Page plus plus. All right, so all we have to do is loop over each page of memory that is being inserted into our map, find the insert point, update the page at that insert point, and then we're done. And then the rest of this will be writing tests to make sure I'm not crazy. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and steal this as well. Good. Um, I have, I put in here this M process ID um, for future compatibility. I actually don't really need it right now. This assert tends to fire when it's not welcome to fire sometimes. Um, but the idea is that in the future, there will be multiple memory maps for multiple processes being debugged. So, um, actually, do I need that? I think I don't actually need that. Yeah, whenever I, in the future I do um, native debugging of multiple processes, I fully intend to have a different, like, child debug process for each one of the like here's my debugger and it spawns an actual separate process to do the actual debugging it communicates over pipe so that i can so that i can uh fan out as many of debug processes as so that there's actually going to only be one memory cache per process but this has been useful for catching some other bugs so i'm going to keep it there okay so um, I actually need to change this memory range. I need to make a new memory range here. Memory range. And I need to say memory contents dot m range dot m address plus page times page size. That is the start and the size will be page size. Okay, so we are going to get the insert point for this page um, if if insert point equals the end memory map dot pushback memory contents. Okay. Otherwise. Um, otherwise, there are two possibilities. One is that one is that there's already something at this point, and one is that there's not. So actually, let me see here. I need to see how next range is implemented. Oh, it uses stud lower bound. So it so it could be that the point I'm looking at right now is the memory I want to write, or it could be that I need to insert something. Okay, so like um, in, let's see, okay, completely new example. Okay, here's my setup. I've already inserted memory page eight and memory page 10, and now we have, and now our memory looks like this right here. Okay, and now we are going to insert memory valid page eight. In this case, insert point will be zero. It's pointing at, um, it's pointing at already existing memory and I have to overwrite, okay? However, if I write page nine, then insert point will be the next memory area in the map with an end address larger than that of the range. With an end address larger than that of the range. Uh, and so it will be, the insert point will be this one right here. So I'm actually looking at, so the insert point will like be pointing at the next one, meaning it's not where I, so I have to insert something into the map here. Um, if it's 10, it will just be pointing at 10. Okay, so, ins so insert point 
So, okay, in this, in this case, insert point will equal zero. In this case, if I want to insert nine, then I'm overwriting this right here, and insert point will equal one, but it means that I have to insert something into my vector. In this case, we're setting valid page 10. Insert point will still be one. I'm now overwriting this guy right here. Insert point will still be one, but it means something different than here. In both cases, insert point is one, but I actually have to check what it is to see whether I have to insert something before it or um, or overwrite the thing that's currently there. So this one, it means uh, overwrite. These are my three cases. This one means insert, and this one means overwrite. Okay, so I really actually have two cases here that I have to account for. And I'm pretty sure that this is completely agnostic to whether the memory is valid or invalid, although I should have tests for both. I should have tests for all these cases. Um, completely agnostic to any of that. Um, because uh, each of these is going to be stored in a separate. And so I don't have to do things like, oh, there's a block of memory here that is that is all valid and I want to insert invalid memory into the only the end of it. And so I have to break up the block. I don't have to worry about any of that because every element in my vector is a different block, um, is a different page. There's a one-to-one -one mapping of valid pages to blocks. Okay, so that makes things easy. So there's just two cases to worry about here. Okay, let's see. I actually need the memory address that I cal calculated right here. So let's go ahead and copy that out. Pa page address, we're gonna make a new variable. Um, size t page address equals uh, I'm actually probably going to have to do a lot of casting here, size T. And then we'll cast it back to a void star right there. Okay. Um, so if memory map at the insert point dot m address equals casting back to a void star page address then, great, we can just overwrite the existing memory. I'll just do this copy, stud copy. Um, I think this is what we need right here. This is the existing page. Grab the existing page. I don't even need this right here because I can guarantee that this is zero. The, the memory range address versus the existing page address. We just, we just guaranteed that that is, um, that that is zero page address. This right here would be page, page address, right? We just guaranteed that this is zero. So memory content start is zero. So we're gonna copy the buffer into the existing page. And let's just go ahead and like, what, hold on. What happens if you stud copy an empty buffer, meaning invalid memory into um, a buffer that actually has data? Let's see. Stud copy, whoops. cppreference.com is an excellent website. Uh, copies all elements starting from first, proceeding to last. Starting from first, com proceeding to last. Undefined what if D first is within the range, first to last, oh, that's not what's happening. 
Uh, only copies the elements. Oh, okay, that's not what we need. Two and four are the same, but execute. Okay. Yeah, I think it it might not. So I need to do like a clear here. I need to do existing page dot clear. Cool. Easy. Easy, right? All right, now we have another case. Otherwise, we'll just move this up here so we can still use it. Uh, no, actually we don't need it here. Memory map dot, dot insert. Uh, stud begin buffer plus insert point. So insert at the insert point. Stud uh, vector insert. I forget the um, the syntax here. Yeah, iterator value. Okay, that's what I thought. So we're going to insert the buffer. Uh, the buffer. No, I need to insert memory contents, which contains a buffer because memory map is a is a map of. Let's see where is memory map. Memory map. This is what I need to do. Memory map dot m contents. Same thing here. Cool. 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 And actually, no, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um, memory, I don't insert all of memory contents because that could be multiple pages. I only insert a single page. Uh, a single page, which I must construct Uh, it's a, so let's see, this is a vector of memory contents. So just have to build a memory contents object. Memory contents, insert contents. This will be a um, void star page address. We're gonna, ins we're gonna construct one of these page address. And then the number of bytes, which is the page size always. And then, um, a stud vector. We'll do this insert contents dot. We'll do another stud copy. Stud copy. Um, stud begin. Insert contents dot and buffer. Uh, oh, I need to I need to fix this here as well. So I need to say uh, plus page times page size plus page plus one times. Page size. So we're only going to copy the part of the buffer that's applicable here. Yeah, let's just go ahead and that's we want the same exact thing basically. Um, uh, start. Let's let's clean this up a little bit. Start copy iterator. Okay. And then we'll have an end copy iterator. End copy iterator. So we're just gonna go from start copy iterator to uh, end copy iterator. Perfect. And we're going to insert it into the existing page or we insert it into this memory contents we just built and then we put that right there 
Okay. Okay. I think that, um, it should be m dot m buffer dot. I think that we're done with set memory. I think we replaced all of this complex code with the realization that it becomes much simpler if you just store one per page. Pretty happy about that. Uh, you know, a lot of this was left over from version one of this where I didn't want to enforce, I didn't realize I should enforce um, a long memory, memory page boundaries. And then, so version two, um, versions two started becoming like the first version was even more complicated than this. Version two is this what you're seeing right here. Version three, I think it's just this. I think it's just this. And then the last thing that I need to complete version three is to, I need a loop in this get memory. So, um, that loop That loop, I believe, starts here. So, we have an insert point right here. If the insert point is after the last element, then the memory is not present. Say, sorry, I don't have that memory in my cache. Okay, otherwise, let's get back some memory contents. Uh, how does this change? How do how does get memory? Here's the question now. How does get memory deal with the fact that things are only uh, accessible on page sizes now? So I think what we're gonna do is. Buffer dot clear. Did it insert extra spaces here? No good. Okay. Buffer dot reserve. We're gonna reserve enough memory. Uh, memory range dot m bytes. This is uh, I you know I've been coding with stud vector long enough to know that if you don't do this I should. Probably should have done that. Well, actually I didn't have to do it here because it's so simple. It's just one assign. Okay, it automatically has the reserve inside it. But anytime you're doing something non-trivial on a buffer and you know what the end result size is gonna be, it's way cheaper if you reserve the memory ahead of time, way cheaper. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. Um, and now we need a loop that similar to before loops over pages and then for each page we're in copies the pages from that part of the memory map into the buffer okay so the first thing we need to do is figure out okay so Actually, I think I'm gonna loop over insert point. Uh, size t k equals insert point. Uh, if I start at insert point, and I can just keep incrementing k until um, until I like run out of memory to copy, and then I know this is gonna be k. Uh, K plus plus to end it off. And uh, what's the middle thing here? How do I test? How do I test whether I've run out of memory to copy? And that's basically maybe this is what I need instead. Oh, 
So maybe what I do here is I say f like um, memory range start and memory range end. Uh, I can I can make two next range calls I think. No, actually, I don't want to use memory uh, next range at all. So here's what I want. Memory uh, next range returns to me the stud distance between the beginning of the memory contents and the iterator returned by the stud lower bound, which does a um, a, uh, a search, um, a binary search through the memory contents. Looking for the item that where um, The end part of the right range is less than the address of the left range. So I can do actually a much simpler search here. Okay. Where I say all of this is the same, I think. Memory contents. Uh, memory content. Do I already have a memory contents right here? Okay, where instead I just say memory address less than, um, and I can just use an address here instead of a range. Range dot m contents. Yeah, this is comparing memory contents to memory range. I think I can just use a void star here. Or no, I'll take the memory range. Okay. So I see address is less than B dot address. So I think that's all I have to do. Um, no, I will take I will actually take the void star. Because I will say range dot m address and then I'll have another one. That gives me range dot m address plus range dot m bytes. Let's just convert these both to size t, just for simplicity. So size t uh, address. And uh, just to clean things up, I believe that these two are both gonna be the same. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is simplify this here like this. Auto, uh, we're just gonna make a, a lambda out of it and then use the lambda in the two lower bound statements. So auto, um, what is this predicate? Lower bound predicate. Cool. And this can just be address. Great. And then we're gonna use this lower bound predicate right here. Look how much this simplifies things. First page iterator. Last page iterator. All right, I might have some off by one errors here. Um, I'm sure I do. We'll work that out in testing. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure I got something wrong in here. 
you know. But uh, let's see here. If first if first page iterator is stud end. of memory contents, then the, then the memory is not present. Okay. Um, and actually, you know what I think I need to do is not this at all. It's the next it's just larger amount of range. Let's do this. No, I should use next range. Yeah, that's what I should do. Okay, third time's the charm, here we go. Start address equals range.m address uh, convert that to a size T. Okay. Um, and I need to like lop off. I need to find the, the page, uh, the page, um, start. Okay. So I'm gonna, this is how much we lop off. Okay. This is like, Find the start start page address. Take the address and then lop off the remainder. Uh, and that's the start of the page of that address. Okay. I guess the other thing that I could do is do integer division by page size and then multiplication again by page size. But I think this is actually faster, maybe. Um, same thing, basically. So this is the starting page. So this is the page that I have my, um, uh, and then I can use this guy right there. The, the thing that's mainly confusing me is like how stud lower bound works, honestly. Uh, let me just look that up again. I wish its interface were a little easier to use with like specifying how the, um, the predicate works. Uh, returns true if the first argument is less than ordered before the second argument. Uh, Returns a iterator pointing to the first element of the range that is not less than. It's like the double negative thing is so tricky to think about. Or last if no such element is found. Uh, and it basically like inside it just does, you can see it is um, logarithmic complexity. So inside it's just doing a um, binary search um, you know, here it is, the binary search. Um, it just uses this comparison. It should be a less than. Uh, so actually, let me just read. If it's true, then it... Advance the iterator by step. Step divided by two, advance the iterator by step. 
first equals okay so it advances first and then it reduces count otherwise it just reduces count count minus equals <laughs> step plus one why the oh right because the okay yeah it, re it reduces, this is like, it could be an odd number. Okay. So if you compare as less than the value, and then while count equals zero. So, damn it. The thing I can't reason out just by staring at it and having to talk through everything on stream is um, whether less than will point you at the... Th at the thing that you're looking at, if you value here, or whether less than or e seems like less than or equal would do that. Uh, I don't know. Whatever. We'll work that out in testing. Okay. I'm just trying to figure if I can figure out how to construct this loop properly, then everything else will be good. Um, start page address. We we get the start page address, and then we have to figure out the index into memory contents of that start page address using stud lower bound. And then we're going to increment this by one, copying things into the buffer until we get to the end and then return. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. So start page address is this guy. Then we're going to find the first page at the start page address. Okay. If it's the end, we return. All right. Otherwise, size t equals index, uh, size t index equals stud distance, stud begin, memory contents, to first page iterator. Great, so now we have the index of the first page. So size k equals index. So this will be a lot easier right here. It is going to be the number of pages we need to look at. Um, I guess we also need to find the last page iterator. Last page iterator. So for that, we're gonna be, need to find the end page address which is going to be we're going to need to do this same thing right here. Um, okay. Okay. I, w I wish I had like a, let's just write it namespace and this will be, um, what should this be called? Oh no, wait, stud almost certainly has this. It's going to be called like stud, um, stud mod integer stud modulus what on earth are you no stud not stud modulus i need it like stud uh round round integers I don't want around floats. I want around integers to other integers. Um, you know what? There's an STB library that does this exactly. Where are you, STB? What was it called? Stud divide or STB divide. Yeah, I don't want to import this just for the one function because I'm pretty sure there's a stud function that does it as well. Uh, 
Uh, I don't need the... Yeah, I, I need... To truncate. Yeah, I need like the stud version of this. Stud truncate. Is there an integer version of this? Integer version, round. Oh, wait, integral type? Set of overloads accepting an argument of any integral type. Yeah, but I can't set, I can't set like the, um, the number to divide by. Lame. I could have sworn stud had something like this. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, okay, well then I'll just make my own. Namespace. Uh, size T. Should I make it templated? No, who cares. Uh, truncate. Size T A. Size T B. Return. A minus A mod B. Right? That's all we need. Take the remainder of the division, lob it off, return the result. Uh, so we're gonna truncate range.m address with the page size. And in this case, we're going to get the end address, which is range.m bytes. Um, and actually these two should be size T. Great. So we have a start address and an end address. Page end address, end page address. There still might be an off by one error here, I think. No, it should be fine. Okay. Start index. We got a start and an end index. Oops, end index. Last page iterator. Start at the start index. While k is less than or equal to the end index. Okay, I think that's it now. We're not gonna need this because we're gonna um, 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 um. So what this will get us is K will walk through memory contents, not through pages. I actually want to walk through pages, not through memory contents. So here's what I actually need to do. For every page, for every page, we are going to uh, we'll put page right here, page right here. For every page, we figure out what entry, what index in our memory contents corresponds with it. Okay. And then we say, if it's not there, 
Return not present. We're done. If... The index we're looking at... Is not the page we're interested in. Return not present. Yeah, so let's see. If the... Whoops. Should just be page iterator. So we look up... We're going to march through pages of memory. We're going to look to see whether that page is in our cache by doing by using stud lower bound. Uh, if, if it's past the end of the cache, then the memory is not present. Okay. Otherwise, this will be a valid index into memory contents. But it might not be the address that we expect because there might be a gap. So if it's not the address we expect, then the then we don't have that memory cached. Okay. If um If we're past the end of the cache, the memory desired isn't present. If this page isn't in the cache, the memory desired isn't present. So now we get to start copying. Uh, oh, actually, there's one thing remaining to check. In this scheme, in this way of doing things, I require that get memory. I, I require that get memory may not cross a boundary of invalid and valid memory. If you start getting valid memory, you have to continue to get invalid memory the whole time. If you start getting if you start getting valid memory, you have to continue getting valid memory. If you start getting invalid memory, it has to be the same type of memory for the entire, otherwise it will return invalid, right? If there's any invalid memory in there anywhere, the entire result is invalid. So I have to check if, uh, let's see here. If the memory contents If it's empty, then return, then let's see, buffer.clear. Cool. This, I think, is all we need to handle the invalid memory case. I'm just gonna delete this. I don't even need it anymore. No, hold on, I'm not that brave. <laughs> okay. If so, if I'm if I'm looking at a page of invalid memory, but present in the cache, but just not just not valid, then clear the buffer. No, that's not all I need because um, bool invalid memory equals false. Invalid memory equals true. Okay, so th then what we're going to do down here is if, if invalid memory, oops, invalid memory, buffer.clear, return memory access result, uh, invalid. Otherwise it's valid. Otherwise it's valid, uh, or, okay. Um, otherwise, let's 
Let's just put that right there. If we ever hit invalid memory, then we stop trying to get valid memory in the entire thing. But we still continue to see whether there is not present memory, which causes us to just return immediately and say, hey, you try to access a, a memory region that was not present. If it's not present anywhere in your access range, then we just say not present for the whole thing. Uh, may as well clear the buffer as well. Okay. So otherwise, we have the task of copying the memory into the buffer. Okay. So then... Here's what we want to do. Um, uh, this is going to be like the only complicated code in the whole thing. Specifically because I have to handle the difference between... Oh, I know how to do this. Size T, co size T copy address equals range dot M address. Cool. So I'm just gonna keep this copy address variable up to date. Okay, it starts at range.m address, and then I can always copy um, starting at this copy address because then at the end of my copy, I'm gonna say copy address equals uh, page, pa page plus page size. So just set it to the just set it to the beginning of the next page. Then the only thing that I have to worry about is whether the, um, this, like, I can start, I can start copying from copy address right here, um, all the way up to the end address that I want. Actually, you know what I can do? So stud copy, I'm just gonna start copying right now. Uh, stud begin. Um, copy address, let's see. Memory contents, index.m buffer plus copy address minus uh, page. Okay. Okay. Start the copy there. And proceed copying until the end of the page. Memory contents index.m buffer. Copy that into buffer. Uh, begin buffer great so we're gonna copy um, yeah we're gonna copy all this stuff now that might copy too much if it does we will just lob off the extra stuff that we copied easy It's never gonna be invalid because we always store the entire page. So we're just gonna always copy everything up to the end of the page. This is the plan. Always copy everything up to the end of the page. And then if it's too much, we can just undo some of that copy. And we copied some things that we didn't want to copy. So we maybe spent a little time copying things that we didn't need to, but it's probably fine. Like the amount of time that it takes to copy that much memory is negligible. If it shows up in profiling, then we can improve this algorithm later. So that's my plan. Um, so then, if range.m address, so basically this right here, is less than page plus page size, then we have to uh, buffer dot. Oh, you know what? I don't even need to do this stupid plan. 
I can just do it the right way to begin with. I can just do this. From the start to the end. So I just have to compute the end right here. Um, let's clean this up a little bit first. Auto start copy iterator equals, wait, do I already have a variable called start copy iterator? Oh, in set memory. How about that? Uh, and then we'll, Looks familiar, huh? Uh, nope, it's not quite the same. Okay, and then the end copy iterator is what's gonna change. If the end of the range that I'm copying is within this page, then I need to copy fewer than the actual number of bytes here. Then, then fewer than the number of bytes in the entire page. Um, and so that will be, um, actually start copy iterator. Huh. Huh. There are two cases here. One is that start copy iterator. I need to do like, what is the end address? Copy address. Let's do this. Start copy address and end copy address, which will be plus range dot m bytes. Okay. And end copy address. Start copy address and copy address. This this gets simpler the more I'm. I, I hope it gets simpler the more I mess with it, not more complicated, right? End copy address. So end copy address minus end page address should be, should be, um, yeah, so I'll do this, begin. It'll be just like this, yeah. End copy iterator begin plus end copy address minus the page start. Otherwise, just copy straight to the end. That looks fine. The other way I could do this is to say end copy address minus page and then truncate that at, no, that's probably more complicated. Okay, I think this does it. Let's try and compile that and get a bunch of errors and then fix up all the errors. I literally think that um, that I've just managed to, oh, no, 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 no. This should say end. This should say stud end buffer. We want to copy it into the end of the buffer so that we don't re overwrite what we've already done. Okay, anyways. Um, so. Memory map. That's an easy fix. M address memory map dot 
and contents. This is the same mistake I made before. Here and here. No, actually, oh shoot. This is already a stud vector. Uh, what was that error then? So we're just gonna fix up all these errors here. M address is not a member of memory contents. Oh, I need to say dot M range. Cool. Uh, this is actually correct right here. I already do the dot M contents up here, so I don't need to do it below. Okay, memory. I'm just gonna standardize this and make the name of the variable here be called memory contents is always the stud vector of contents. Oh wait, but memory contents is, oh no. Okay, so I guess I have to call it memory map. That explains why I called it memory map. So then I'll standardize it down here, memory map. We call it memory map everywhere. Okay. Range is an undeclared identifier. It's called memory range. Okay. You should just so uh, just say memory map. Fixing up compiler errors. M address is not a member of I should say dot m range dot m address. These should say memory range. Getting close. This just needs conversion to size T. I think we've got it, folks. I think we've got it. So let's go to the tester. And we'll start right here. Um, we definitely have to... Hmm. Yeah, the tester... Hmm. The tester wants now wants everything in um, sets. Uh, I basically have to rewrite this entire... This entire testing suite. Yeah, all of these all of these tests need to be rewritten because they did not go with the um, with the new assumption that I've made that everything is along page boundaries, which simplifies the code huge amount. Um, but see, it puts eight bytes, eight specific bytes of code into the right, and then tests that is directly before that point in memory where I put it in is not present. Things directly before are not present. Things overlapping directly before and in the range are not present. Um, and then it checks that um, it checks that something in the range is present and that the top of the range is present. And I can get the whole right like I can get all this stuff. But if I just run this test right now, it will assert right here because of my new assumption that everything has to be along page boundaries. 
So I'm just going to need to update the test. So let's do this. Stud vector of uint 8 t uh, memory con memory buffer uh, dot memory buffer. Okay, four int k equals zero. K is less than four thousand ninety six. K plus plus. I'm not going to use the same. My quality bar lowers in test code. Four thousand ninety six is definitely the page size. Memory buffer dot push dot push back. Whoops. Um, K modulus two fifty six. Two fifty six being the largest number plus one that you can fit into um, an unsigned 8-bit integer. We put that right there. So now our memory buffer will contain 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 7, okay. And we're just gonna actually, we're gonna take that and we're gonna move it up here so that it can be used with any of these tests. Uh, and we're gonna do this, memory buffer one. Memory buffer two will actually contain two pages, 4,096 times two, just so that I can test putting two pages in um, at the same time. That's probably all that I will need. So memory buffer one uh, at this point, Spot right here at this address, uh, 4,096 bytes. I'm just gonna go ahead, I guess, and const int page. Uh, I guess it should be a size T. Page size equals for 4,096, just to make a little bit more declarative. Uh, okay, page size. So this is the second page of memory right here. Um, we're going to leave one page empty and then insert for our test something into the second page of memory and then leave everything else empty. Now, this one is a fake process ID. We get to just ignore it. So, I think I can just start adding zeros to this. Zeros and Fs. This is what I have to do right here, basically. Oh, no, 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 no. Like this. So this is testing that the bytes immediately previous are not present. Not present. So 16 bytes pre previous, that should be not present. One byte previous, that should be present. So, uh, a request that straddles the first byte present and the um, previous byte should be marked as not present. The first byte should be okay, present. The last byte, which is 2FFF, should be present. If I try to get all bytes, Two o o o page size. That should be okay. And my buffer compare should compare equivalently to the original buffer that I put in. Um, if I get four buffers at the fourth position, I'm sorry, four bytes at the fourth position, then I should get four, five, six, seven. I don't have to change that. Because remember, I pushed uh, consecutive bits of memory here. Okay. If I get nine bytes, in other words, if I start at the beginning, so this is what it's, if I'm starting at the beginning and I get one more byte than is available in the buffer, then that should be not present. If I try and get one byte past the buffer, then that should be non-present. I'm no longer changing memory in the middle. This is like not a thing that I support anymore. So actually a lot of these tests might get a lot easier. 
Yeah, look at this. I don't have to... I think I can just... So I'm now changing the memory at point at at um, two bytes in, and and checking to make sure that it's all still okay. I think I can just delete all this. Just checking to make sure that that's still the same. Yeah, because I can no longer update only part of the memory. I now have to update the entire page. So. I think I, I get to just delete all this. Yep. All right, let's see whether that, let's get this, let's make a goal because we're we're approaching two hours into this stream. And um, it's good to have a goal, something that we want to do before the stream ends. And I'm thinking if we can just get this test block right here to complete, I'll call that good and I'll do the rest of the tests off stream. And just to make it more interesting, I'm going to see whether we can debug this in Lux itself. We're going to do a special treat. Um, this might not work because I just messed around with it. <laughs> like with the, actually this is certainly, this is almost certainly not going to work because I just messed around with a pretty foundational um, aspect of how Lux works. It's memory cache. And so I'm just going to go ahead and expect this not to work. Uh, oh, wait. I'm, I need to, um, I need to specify specifically that I'm going to run the memory cache test. Memory cache. Okay, load that and find the test buffer to, what did i call it whoops what did i call this memory buffer memory buffer yeah okay we're going to run it right there Knew it. I knew it. Well. You can't win them all. Oh, oops. This should just be... Okay, well, <laughs> so we know we have some problems with our memory cache yet, our completely rewritten memory cache. I'm just going to go ahead and honestly, I'm so happy with this new code. Uh, look at all this crap I get to delete. It's so delicious. Deleting code is the best. The get is a little bit more complicated for sure, but the set is way... <laughs> Hey, less complicated. Oh man, it's so much less complicated. I've now given up the um, the uh, support for writing memory that's not in um, uh, a page size, which I might need. For example, if I if I ever want to do something like um. In Visual Studio, you can update the value of a local variable in the debugger. You can force it to update. So you're only updating like that one little bit of memory. And I'll have to change this to support that. Um, but that's not a big deal. I can just say, if you want to do that, then you are only allowed to do it if you're writing to memory that's already present in the debugger. I can do it in another function. So this will stay as simple as it is. This will not get any more complicated. So anyway, um, yeah, let's go ahead and compile that. And then I'm going to go ahead and run the tester not in Lux because Lux is probably pretty messed up right now until I work out all the bugs. I'm gonna write some very exhaustive, exhaustive tests for this. This should never break. 
and it should account for every single one of these possibilities. Uh, in the end. But until then, we're just going to run the tester. And what do we got? Boom. Okay. So we're going to set some memory. Look at this beautiful buffer full of my placeholder values that goes sequentially up to 255, at which point they reset, scroll in, scroll in, scroll in, 255 and then reset, so good. And the size is 4096, which is one page. Here's the range. So, I'm gonna set one page here. Page address is, let's look at this in hex. 2000, just as expected. Insert point will be uh, tilde zero. So we just push it back. Easy peasy. Great. Debug check. Hmm, this is actually something I need to update now. Buffer size and range bytes should be equal or else buffer size should be zero. That we can keep, but then this part of it checks that ranges are ordered, that's what we want. Ranges overlapping. Ranges should not be overlapping, but this line right here we should get rid of. Debug check. This is the, this is the, um, invariant that we removed. Ranges are now allowed to touch. Previously, uh, two, rain, two uh, c contiguous sections of code had to be um, in one element, and now that's no longer true. Contiguous sections of code, uh, two elements can be contiguous. Everything else can stay though. All right, and we're not gonna get it this time because there's only one element. So now let's get memory. Okay. Uh, start copy address, end copy address, reserve. Okay, page start, oh, interesting. Page start address. Start page address is wrong. Start copy address. Oh yeah, I definitely got this wrong. A minus A and B, there's A. A and B is FF. So this should return 1000. It returns F. It returns FFO. Did I screw this up somehow? A and B. B. Uh, oh, oh I'm, f I'm stupid. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's what we needed. Obviously. Obviously. I was just checking to make sure you were paying attention. All right. So let's run that tester again. Set memory is fine. We'll go to get memory. Start page address is 1000 as expected. 
And page address should also be 1000. There is a, we should have a page iterator. It'll be, um, the index will be zero. It is zero. If we're past the end of the cache, the memory desired is not present. Okay, but this guy right here will be wrong because it will say, we need index zero. Index zero is actually uh, the memory for address 2000, but we're looking for 1000. So it's gonna say not present, go away. So that's correct. Awesome, so far so good. The next one returns not present, that's correct. Not present, that's correct. Actually, I wanna walk through this one and make sure it's working properly too. Because this time the end copy address is, um, is inside the next page, so it spans a page. So begin, but it will actually early out because it will see the, in, at the first page it will see, yeah, great. So that's actually the same code path as before because the, it errors out at the first page. This one, the start copy address, is the first byte of the page. So we're good now. The start copy iterator is just the beginning of the buffer because these two are the same. Um, we do take this branch. This is going to be one, so it's going to end copy iterator will be one more than start copy iterator. So buffer will be, oops, cannot seek vector iterator after end. Whoops, I'm sorry. But it's not. Can I, okay, which, which, of, which of the iterators is it not liking? That's the question. It's the last, it's this one. Uh, oh, I can't tell. I'm pretty sure it's this one and not this one. Even though the arrow's pointing here, it's saying it's gonna return to here, but it's in the middle of, oh, no, 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 it's calling get unwrapped n. Yeah, okay. So it's the destination iterator that it's complaining about. Yeah, definitely the destination iter iterator that it's complaining about. Uh, my destination iterator is stud and buffer. Yeah, which is correct because I want to copy it to the end of the buffer because each page that I copy has to go into the end of the buffer that I'm copying. I want to copy into the beginning of the buffer. That wouldn't make any sense. But the end is just, the end is, it's valid to start copying things to the end of the buffer. Why not? Oh, I think I have to, oh yes, of course. This will be in that code that I deleted. I think I actually have to expand the buffer. Yeah, I have to resize it first. Yeah, that's what I wasn't doing. Okay, well I can do that. Resizing, here we go. Thanks, tests. Stud copy. Uh, wait, I don't do it here? Hmm, oh, it's because this never gets to, okay, well. Um, resize, page size, that'll fix that. Resize page size. And over here, 
resize. Uh, anyway, I guess I need to keep track of bytes because I can't use stud end anymore because that will just literally point to the end. So I need a bytes copied equals zero. And then here, instead of copying it to the end of the buffer, I copied it to begin plus bytes copied. And then I have to increase bytes copied by uh, bytes copied plus equals stud distance um, um, and copy iterator. No, 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 it's start copy iterator and copy iterator, something like that. Yeah, in that case, we'll do this. Uh, end copy iterator. Like this. And no shadowing. And we'll just... Normally I like to initialize all variables, but this one's like... Actually, let's do this. Let's do this. There. That will work. So we're going to copy it. And then, you know what? Just for um, safety right here, we're going to say assert bytes copied. Just to make sure our algorithm is correct, bytes copied equals, I forget what the name of our memory range is. Memory range, or the name of our memory is memory range. Co expected, so we have to write a message here, expected to copy this many bytes, actually copied this many bytes. Um, memory range dot m bytes. Uh, bytes copied. Cool. All right, that should be correct now. So it always copies into the end of, so it just keeps track of where the end is, where it's copying right now. Um, yep, resizes the whole buffer, the, how, however big it should be up front, keeps track of where it has copied to, copies into that location. We should be good, okay. Let's run this bad boy again. Oh wait, did I, did I do stud cop? Yeah, I didn't even do it for this one. Uh, no, I did. Is this everything I have to do? Yes, okay, I think I'm good. So I updated all the places where I needed to update. Okay. Well, that's better than the crash I was experiencing before. Um, yeah, this should be valid. So let's go ahead and step back in here. What does our memory map have in it? It has one page at address 2000. And here are all the bytes that are valid. So the contents look good. Start copy address is correct. End copy address is correct. Start page and page are both correct. I clearly just have an off by one error in here. Oh yeah. Um, I know what the off by one error is. 
So we're good. We copy our one bit of memory here. Bytes copied is one. Copy Start copy address 3000. So now I have like the case where you end the copy. See, this is, this is why tests are amazing. This is why tests are amazing. Copying the very last byte of a page. Who would have thought that that would cause an error? But I tried to I tried to test all of the edge ba edge cases. What if you know I I don't think this test has ever failed before. It always succeeded in the previous implementation. I don't think there was ever a problem. It's only failing now that I've rewritten the implementation, and that's what we have these tests for. So I'm very pleased about this. Okay. Um, so then the only question is how do we, how do we fix this? If I, so I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of doing the right thing. It's saying, oh, well, this page isn't in the cache. Problem is I actually only want zero bytes out of the page. Like I don't actually want any bytes out of this page. So I could just say, um, you know, if no more bytes return or break. Um, the other option that I could do is say that the end address is actually minus one here right and that would mean that that the last page is still page 2000 um this would be fine and page address is 2000 why do i feel like I'm missing something. Oh, I would need to end copy iterator. I would need to, actually this would work just, I think this would just work. End copy, no, I would need to update this right here. I would need to add the byte back in right here if I did that. And I would need to say like end copy address plus one. Uh, here's what I do instead actually, end page address Maybe I put the minus one right here. So take that minus one out. Maybe I put the minus one right here. Okay. And copy address. And then this forces that if I'm copying all the way up to the end of the page, um, then it just won't include the next page. And page address gets used there. I think this is the answer, except that this minus one is super odd. And so I have I would have to leave a comment there and be like, here's why I put this minus one there. But this minus one only matters. The only place where this minor, minus one makes a difference is if the end copy address is on a page boundary. Okay, if that's the case, then the minus one takes it to, it's, if, if it's like the first byte in a page, then it pulls it down to the last byte of the previous page, which is actually exactly what we want. So I'll just put, I'll just put a little comment right here. Minus one so that we don't copy, we don't proceed into the next page if we don't want any bytes from it. It's a bit of a hack, but it actually does exactly what we want, so I'm gonna go with it. Okay. Let's run them tests. So far, so good. Set memory, get memory. 
let's see. Memory range. Okay, this is the case that we're looking at. So start and end pages are now the same. So it's going to start on that exact page. This is where I'm like abusing for loops. Normally you would see a less than here. Uh, here you see a less than or equal to, which is correct for what we're doing. But it's kind of like, it's like a subtlety that you miss if you, um, if you aren't paying attention. Um, and a person may assume that it works the way, it, like it does logistically, logically, work the way other for loops do. You loop from the start page address to the end page address, except that you do it inclusively of the end page address in this loop, uh, but you do it exclusively normally when you say, you know, int k equals zero, k is less than something, not less than or equal to something. Um, I'm only okay with it because this is low level code where a person is more likely, much more likely to actually pay attention to that sort of thing. And um, this doesn't loop over a container, <clears throat> it loops, from a number to a number. If this were a container, it'd be like container dot size. <clears throat> if, the, if it were that, and it had less than or equal to, then a person would assume like it's like any other loop. Okay, start copy iterator, end copy iterator. So now, great, we're gonna copy one, one byte at position zero End copy iterator, start copy iterator. I can't really read what these iterators are about to do, but I believe our buffer should have one thing in a noun. It should value 255. It does. Yeah, that's value 255. Um, we copied one byte. Our new copy address is the start of the next page, 3000, but we're never actually gonna get there because we killed the loop now because of that minus one. The minus one did its job. Uh, so great, now what happens if we, oops, this is gonna fail. Bonk. I just have to update it to say 255. All right. So let's recompile that and then head back to where we were. And if we can get through the rest of these test cases, I'm gonna call it a night. I'm gonna say it's good. Honestly, like if we get through all these test cases, I have a basically working memory cache for anything that the user could possibly throw at it, all memory access patterns. Okay. So here's where we get the entire page Start page address 2000, end page address also 2000. Start copy address 2000 to 3000. Okay. The page is there and it's valid. We copy one page worth of bytes. We don't proceed to the next page. We're good. That test passes. All right. Now we're just gonna get four bytes from the middle. So yes, we're gonna, this is the first time I think we're, we're actually gonna go into here. We set the end iterator, the end copy iterator, end copy address minus end page is, this will be eight. 
So we're going to copy to end position 8. This should copy 4 bytes. 4, 5, 6, 7. We claim we copied 4 bytes. Start copy address goes up by... Start copy address goes up to 3000, but that's okay because we never actually go to the next loop. But I do need another test here, I am realizing. Um, no, that was covered in this one. Yeah. Okay, so we're fine. Bytes copied four should be bytes requested four. And we're good. All right, so now if we try to get, um, if we try to access page size plus one bytes, it will go one into the next page and that should be invalid. So start page address should be 3000 now, which will push us over into the next page even despite the minus one. So we're gonna copy everything out of this page. Bytes copied one page worth. Start copy address is now 3000. We go over to the next page. The next page we see is uh, right, it's past the end of the map, past the end of the cache. And so we clear the buffer that we copied. We say the memory is not present, we return. That is correct. And now we're gonna try and copy the first byte of of after the, the memory that we've copied in there. Okay. 2001 to 2002. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, I wrote this test wrong, I think. I think this is supposed to test um, that you cannot access one past the end. Uh, 104 invalid memory content. It's this one. And yeah. So this should read 3001. Well, no, it should read 3000. Yeah, so 3000 is the first not present byte in um, in the memory cache. And it should read as not present. And then that will be it. I'm thinking that one will pass. But we're gonna step into it just in case and watch it work. Boom. Start copy address 3000 and copy address 3001. Start page address 3000 and page address also 3000. We're going to prepare to copy one byte. Okay. Index is past the end, so we're not present and we're good. Okay. I think we did it. If I continue to go through subsequent tests, it's gonna hit the assert that I added that makes sure that, um, that all memory accesses are along page boundaries. I'm going to, just because I'm crazy, I'm going to actually try to run Lux and see how far I am. Like it will probably not work because I have many more tests to write and these tests will expose new problems. But you never know. I'm gonna tell Lux to run itself and we'll see what happens. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at that. Um, yeah. It appears to be working actually. Well, 
It worked until this moment. Let's see here. Oh yeah. So iterators don't oh this this is Okay, set memory, uh, buffer, oh, this should say, st this should say begin. I'm, I'm silly. Begin, so we begin, yeah, end copy iterator, of course, of course it would complain about that. Can't add anything to the end and have it still be a valid iterator. So this, you, you wanna start the copy at the beginning plus whatever page you're on and end the copy at the beginning plus the, the page after it. Yeah, okay, well, we found a bug, not through a test case, but still, oops. Um, let's run Lux again. This is fine, I'm actually impressed on about how much that worked up until the point where I added the second page of memory. <laughs> Up until that point, I think I had only added one page of memory to the cache, and when it tried to add the second page, um, because I was doing whatever, is when it is when it died. So let's run a simpler program. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Look at that. So we're gonna just add disks to this array. Do I support? No, I don't support stud array yet. So we're just gonna skip this part. Uh, native visualizer for stud array should be pretty straightforward given that I already have vector. Mm, just haven't done it yet. Oh, also it's a stud array of stud vectors. I'm very efficient with my, with my usage here. Anyway, yeah. Everything seems like, I wouldn't get all of, all of these numbers come straight from the memory cache, right? And they all appear to be valid. Other is going to get set to one. Yeah, so that's good. We jump back into the, okay. And so now at this point, it's probably added the second page to my cache. And so I'm getting another error at the same spot. So I'll clearly have something else that I have to, oh, that's because the size is zero. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna have to do some rethinking here about how I do these iterators, but um, but this is just trying to figure out how to get stud, uh, Stud iterators to work, I think. Probably not a problem with the algorithm. I may find some problems with my algorithm later, but I will continue that off stream because we have at least a huge part of the algorithm that works properly. So that is definitely a success. Um, there's, there's definitely more things to fix in here and I'll be doing that. And I will be, um, I'll be fixing all these problems and then releasing the next version of the debugger pretty soon, probably within a, like a uh, within like a week. I'm gonna try and do it this weekend. Um, and the point of, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the point of this version of the debugger is that it's the first reasonable build that I can replace Visual Studio with for my own debugging. So that will be a huge milestone um, for me. The usability um, bar will go up a lot with it. Uh, I already have things like stud vector native visualizer and stud map vi native visualizer so that I can tell what's going on in my own data structures. Uh, and so this is gonna be a large step in, in making it so that I can use the debugger and at least get information for myself um, about what the debugger needs to improve. And if you want to try it out yourself, uh, you can. As I said at the beginning of the video, you can go to luxdebugger.com and you can, um, you can join the alpha there where you can try the debugger out for yourself uh, and give feedback in, in, in the course of development um, 
to the developers, help us steer the direction of the project. Uh, I'm building a debugger that is, um, is, is going to have things that have never before been seen in a debugger. I want to create the next evolution, the next step in debugger evolution. So, um, and so I need your help to do that. So go to luxdebugger.com, sign up for the alpha, try it out. Um, and, uh, you, if you do so, you'll see another build that you can try out probably within the next week. So thank you everybody for coming, for watching. I do this every Tuesday, every Tuesday night. Um, I start, uh, somewhere around seven o'clock. I did about eight o'clock today where I'll show you another part of the inside of the debugger. And we'll go on a tour and we'll watch me struggle to try and pro solve programming problems live on stream, which is incredibly difficult <laughs> and also really fun. I enjoy it every time that I do this. So thank you everybody for coming. See you next time.